welcome. Thank you so much for joining the World Affairs Council of Connecticut today to discuss resilience, how things bounce back with a very special guest, Andrew Zoli. Andrew is the Chief Impact Officer at Planet. He is also the author of Resilience, How Things Bounce Back. You can find out more and check out the book at andrewzoli.com. It's fantastic. Uh, and I know that this is a topic we're all pretty interested in now uh, more than ever. My name is Amanda, executive producer with the council. So today's structure will kick off with a conversation with Andrew Zoli and Megan Torrey, CEO of the World Affairs Council of Connecticut. We also have a special opportunity today. Uh, towards the end of the event, we're going to have a community conversation around the topic of resilience with Andrew. Um, so we'll let you know, I'll give you a heads up when we're about to get started. But at that point, we'll invite you all to join in the conversation. You're invited to turn on your microphones, turn on your cameras. We'll promote you to a panelist. You'll be part of the discussion. And um, we'll have a roundtable conversation about instances of resilience that you've seen this year in your community or in the world, instances of fragility. And um, we'll, we'll dive into that deeper later. So again, I've been talking too much. We have a lot to get to. Uh, so let's get started. I'll turn it over to you, Megan. Megan Tory, CEO of the World Affairs Council. Thank you, Amanda, and welcome, Andrew. Thank you everyone for joining us for our season three premiere of State of the World. Um, and we wanted to do something a little bit different today for our season three premiere. Many of you know that we started State of the World um, directly because of the pandemic, because we weren't together, because we were um, still, we still understood that providing the kind of globally focused content that focuses on critical global issues was important to you, our community. And so I couldn't think of a better way than to start season three talking about resilience, this, this, this concept that all of us have sort of never heard more, you know, more about resilience than, than because of the pandemic, right? Um, and what that actually means for us personally, for us as a community, for us as a nation, for, and especially at this time, for us as a world. So to get us started today in a little bit of a different format, I'm going to throw it over to Andrew um, for him to tell us about what it means to be in the moment that we're in now. Well, first of all, Megan and Amanda and all of you at the World Affairs Council and those of you who are listening to this and some of you, some of you who may later watch some of this, I just want to say it's, it's a great pleasure and an honor to be with you. I'll just say a word or two, maybe of general introduction. Uh, I'm one of those people who has a, a broad and eclectic portfolio of things that I that I work on. Um, much of my work has been about strategic foresight in how we use the tools of uh, new technologies and new approaches to better understanding the, the context of the world that we're in and how we begin to think about kind of structural and systemic change in ways that allow us to absorb the, the kind of shocks and disruptions. I, I really think that in some ways, uh, we're really shaped by the first full decade that we spend as an adult, you know, when we're out on our own in our early lives. And for me, I'll share that that decade was the 90s. And, you know, if we reflect back on the 90s, with, with a little recession in the beginning of the decade, it was pretty go-go, right? It, we lived in a world where American, uh, an age of American triumphalism, the Soviet Union was in decline, the internet was ascendant, we had people writing books with titles like The End of History, that we'd sort of worked out the basic structures of governance, that conflicts would be virtual and creative and commercial, not international and not hot wars, but but uh, but uh, sort of creative wars for soft power. We spent a lot of time talking about that. And think about the decade that followed. The decade, the first decade of the 21st century, is a decade that was bookended by profound disruption at the in, in the same zip code, both on Wall Street. We, we started the decade with 9-11, we ended with the global financial crisis and sandwiched in between we had, uh, we had Iraq and Afghanistan and Katrina and a general sense, and this is to say nothing of climate change, biodiversity loss, these other forces, but this general sense that we were um, entering a period of, of a kind of blender of volatility, just the world that, that was so, where the forces of, of change and disruption were so profound that they 
uh, that they swamped easily the kind of institutional apparatuses that we had established to, to contend with them. And so uh, it was clear, I think, and has become much clearer in the decade that followed that first decade, that we have to move to a more sustainable place and at the same time engage in this hat trick of being getting to a place that's more sustainable and being more resilient at the same time because there will inevitably be connected shocks and disruptions. So I thought maybe if, just as a word or two, just to start us off, I, I'd actually like to show a couple of things. For those of you who are listening, I'll describe them as we go along so that you're not losing out. And I hope everyone uh, here has a chance to, to see them. But that's going to require me to share my screen. So let me let me do that. You know, I, I really think that the purpose of organizations like the World Affairs Council are, are best reflected in my single favorite quote. It's by a famous physicist named John Wheeler, who was a contemporary of Albert Einstein, who famously said, we shape the world by the questions we ask. And what seems to me great about this series and, and why I was so honored that Megan asked me to participate was because of the questions that you're asking here. And that's, that's really terrific. I think asking the right questions is, an, is a moral act. It actually shapes uh, the, the, and opens and forecloses certain things. So I wanna start with this question that I think is essential to understanding these questions of resilience. And that's really where we are now. And I, I have a chance to ask that question and have conversations about it with senior governmental, military, institutional, philanthropic, intergovernmental, NGO, scientific partners all the time because of what I do in my day job, which we'll get to later. And if you, if you just harmonize all the answers, you get something that looks a little like this, which for those of you who can't uh, see this is a picture of Dorothy in the tornado. And, you know, we're not, in, we're not in one regime of stability, nor are we in the next regime of stability. We're in a period of punctuated equilibrium where there's enormous disruption and accelerating and intensifying disruption. When people are confronted with that kind of disruption, they ask themselves basic questions. When, when we find ourselves in, institutionally and societally having skidded off the road, or if we find ourselves in enormously rocky seas, there are basic questions that get asked, like where are we going? Societally, that question is being asked right now. And institutions have not had good answers. We have people who are saying, all is lost and fend for yourselves. We have people who say, keep going to the next point of equilibrium. And we have people who are going, hooray, the world is on fire. And, <laughs> and right now it's very hot, hard to find the kind of conversational consensus. So we have, we have folks who, who are working furiously to close that range of volatility, even as we have people who are working to exploit it. And in between, one thing that's essential to observe is that people who find themselves in a ditch who say the world, the way forward, the way out of this ditch is to go forward. And people who find themselves in that same ditch in the same car, who say the way to get out of this ditch is to go backwards, are both expressing rational responses to finding themselves in a ditch. And in many ways in our currently deeply sorted out and segregated society, we have relation, we have communities and political parties and institutions that have separated themselves into groups that say the answer, I can see myself in the future, the answer is to move forward. And people say, I can't see my way through that future, the answer is to go backwards. And the openness to the future or a sense of sort of epistemological closure to the future defines the separateness of our communities. And one essential thing we have to do is negotiate with each other through this period. Now, one of the challenges I think we have is best expressed by one of my other favorite thoughts expressed by, by uh, the noted thinker, Stuart Brand, who said very famously, in our society, the fast moving trends get all the attention, but it's actually the slow structural forces of change that actually have most of the power. If you, if you look at the world, we spend a lot of time focusing on shiny objects, but when systems fundamentally erode and then tip over, they tip over in ways that are not recoverable. 
And so one of the sort of fundamental challenges is how we think and pay attention to changes that are not salient to us. We're really living in a time when the challenges we're confronting are bigger than our cognition. The, the, the data on what kinds of uh, the, the kind of climate impacts, the, the rate of biodiversity loss, the interconnected impacts on human health and civilizational scale conflict are just hard to process. They're hard to process for us individually. It's hard to process institutionally. But we're also living, so you know, at a, at a kind of biotic level, we are living through the earliest stages of what might be the sixth extinction, the sixth time in the 4.5 billion history of life on Earth when biodiversity has radically collapsed. The last time you might remember was the meteorite and the dinosaurs. If we were making that play as a school play again today, we would cast human beings in the role of the meteor. It's our impacts that are actually causing this rapid decline in biodiversity. It's hard to think about at, at the scale that it's happening. But it's also true that we're living through the second renaissance. We're living through this massive explosion of technologies and capabilities. And that in itself is a, ch is a challenge. It's hard to think about how to use our tools successfully. And the moral challenge in front of all of us is how we align the two and how we engage in the right kinds of institution building and the right kinds of deep social repair that will be needed so that we remind everyone that we are deeply and inextricably linked to each other. The last thing I'll just say, just to introduce the conversation on resilience, is, is what do we mean by being resilient? Now, people who write and think about resilience, who, who work on it in an applied context, they often will give you two kinds of answers. So one answer is the ability to uh, continue your core purpose with integrity, regardless of uh, disruption. So it's ability to absorb shocks. And that emphasizes a kind of stability of systems view of the world. How do we just ensure that our systems are hardened sufficiently? The other view, and, and this is one that I, I actually tend to gravitate to, is in an era where we will inevitably be surprised. No one saw COVID coming six months beforehand. I mean, we had institutions, I should say, that's not true. We have people who were involved in pandemic surveillance, but nobody at the societal level was prepared for what became of that shock who were outside of those specialized communities. So we have to ask ourselves, how do we help ourselves and our communities, our organizations, our societies persist, recover, or even flourish amid disruption. And that is, represents an opportunity to introduce new kinds of verbs into society, new kinds of institutional structures into society. It requires us to think about risk, especially catastrophic or extreme risk differently. And that's what we should be talking about today. And um, would love to explore any of these ideas. Maybe we'll dip back in to some visuals later um, when we talk about some of these new technologies. So oh, absolutely. Let's continue on uh, a theme that you just sort of brought up, right? We talked about COVID and COVID being a shock uh, in the ultimate sort of test of resilience. So where have we seen resilience? Are there specific cases that you can talk about for better or for worse? In the, con in the context of COVID, I think, you, you know, th there are, Resilience is an interesting term because it represents, it's sometimes described as a kind of interpersonal value. Well, that person's highly resilient. Sometimes we use it to describe an abstract aspect of a system, like the system was able to absorb shocks and disruptions. So it's important to say that there has been an immense amount of resilience demonstrated by everyone collectively. I mean, we have had people, and, and much of it, some of it un, unacknowledged. I mean, we had a lot of people during COVID who were declared essential, who candidly not, were not always treated as essential, but they made sure that everybody had enough food to eat. Now, we, there were people who were food insecure during COVID because of the disruptions, but the ability of the systems to rapidly mobilize, and this is one of, the, one of the most important system dynamics of resilient systems, is their ability to sense and respond. So actually, you know, it might be worth, Megan, just me describing one aspect of, of, of one of the most useful ways of thinking about it. 
uh, that we discovered in our own work on this subject. So all resilient systems, the, and I, I mean this at every scale from the cells that make up your body, the communities that make up your society, all the, you know, the, the, the people in an organization who, who make an organization work, all these different levels of scale do four basic things we found, four kind of clusters of activity. You might call them the verbs of resilience. So the first thing is those systems uh, engage in what's called regener building regenerative capacity. By regenerative capacity, what I mean is they build the slow muscles of health. So for instance, in your uh, body right now, your body is being slowly replenished, you know, and, and for all of us, what's the leading indicator of whether or not we'll survive a heart attack? It's how healthy we were the day before the heart attack. So having a healthy system remain healthy is slow and deeply unsexy work. It's, it's just the day in day out process of like making sure you're going for a run and eating your vegetables, that, that sort of thing in it, in a societal context, that regenerative capacity might be measured in other ways, like the entrepreneurial and creative permissioning of, of a community to be able to allow its people to try new things is a, is a deep measure of societal resilience. But it's slow work. Then next to it, the next verb of resilience is about listening for change. It's about instrumenting systems so that they are continuously observing and listening for the earliest signs of disruption. Not every disruption, not every earthquake pre-announces itself, but the very act of listening and looking is itself a form of regenerative capacity. And it's a very active process. So having systems in a society that are looking at emerging threats and, and responding to them in an, in an agile way is an essential part of resilience. And in fact, actually that's the third category. The third category is responding to disruptions when they occur. And both listening and responding in resilient systems are very fast loop. That, that is where we're constantly listening, we're constantly adapting. And then the fourth category, the last category is about learning and transformation. When a system has shown itself to be vulnerable, how do we decide when we want to strengthen it and when we want to abandon it and actually replace it with something else, that's a, that's a slow process. Learning and transforming systems is deep work. So you have building regenerative capacity and learning and transformation, that, those are slow cycles. And then in the middle, you have fast cycles. So let's apply some of that thinking to what we learned in the age of COVID. A lot of people showed a great deal of agility. We literally moved huge portions of the workforce into Zoom world where we're having this conversation. <laughs> we managed to, uh, certain organizations responded by dramatically ramping up and moving very, very quickly. It is unprecedented that we got vaccines within a single calendar year. That is just, at, that is literally the textbook uh, example, and it will win lots of people Nobel Prizes, or should. We're still in the middle of that process right now. And the challenge I think we have is that is what will come next. It's the deep learning and transformational component when we come out of this in the next year or two. Uh, and we will not all come out of it at the same speed. Now, the other thing, though, is that we also showed where systems were really irresilient. So one of the things that we saw was that in our sorted out communities, the levels of impact were hugely and disproportionately felt. So, you know, in, in certain uh, African-American communities in the, in the United States, the COVID infection rate was five or six times what it was in other places, which is really a proxy for access to healthcare. It was about the limitations of that regenerative capacity. And, and there's a wonderful thought here, you know, that, that um, I think has been often said, there is no such thing as a natural disaster. You know, the, the, we think of COVID as if it were a public health issue, which it is, but really it's an ecological disaster. We can talk more about that in a minute, but it revealed as much as it caused pain. It showed us where the long lasting rot in some of our systems really exists. And that rot is systemic intergenerational underinvestment that has led to trauma and has led to incredible suffering and really disproportionate outcomes. So 
this is an interesting lens to kind of apply to not just to COVID, but to lots of things. Um, but I think we've seen resilience and, and irresilience in kind of equal measure during this. So perfect. I want to just um, I want to move on to your, your work at Planet, but right before we do, I want to talk about how resilience relates to global affairs, and I know you have an answer about that. Um, but we also I want to bring in an audience question. Uh, globally, we've uh, been faced with the degradation of democratic values and the rise of populism. Are you able to comment on this disruption in how to maintain resilience in the democratic process in either current or emerging democracies? Well. The assessment that is the 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 it, it is at the heart of that question is absolutely correct. Um, you know, I, I think um, political scientists and people working in international affairs cite the underlying structural reasons for the rise of populism and the erosion of democratic values around the world in a, many different places. I mean, it, it's it's not a trend that has a single cause. I think it has many causes, and it has different causes in different places. So I, I think we have to be careful not to overgeneralize. But having said that, now let me overgeneralize, which is to say that I, I think um, what we have uh, concurrently is we have a world of extraordinary volatility and a world that where the disruptions are not just related to things like climate, they're related to the role of technology in society, the ability for people to see themselves in the future, the issues of displacement, and uh, institutions that were geared toward a different world, a world that moved at an intrinsically different pace. All, many of those kinds of forces combined with the advent of profound technologies of control. So you have uh, a, a deeply uncertain future, a deeply anxious set of populace, you know, populaces around the world, the wrong kinds of institutions that are that are set up to solve essentially the last war's problems, and you have technologies of surveillance and control that allow for um, for autocrats to take to follow the autocrats' playbook, but to use twenty first century tools to do it, and so it's not surprising. That we're seeing this kind of erosion. We're also seeing, you know, it's one of the ways I'll just talk about the technology piece of that. Um, I think we're in a deep, uh, there's a deep structural conflict that's going on. When I look at the network, and by which I mean the digital networks that, that define society, you know, they were, they're really political philosophies encoded in a technology. The earliest forms of the internet are, oh, a very deep, um, uh, they're like a kinship, they have a kinship relationship with sort of like anarchic benign libertarians in, in the Bay Area in the 1970s and 80s. That there's a reason why to use the internet, you don't need to go to the DMV and get a license, but to drive a car you do. And the, the reason is that there was this belief that if we empower the edge of society, that we will enable good things to happen, entrepreneurial and creative things to happen, and will enable bad things to happen. There'll be people who wanna, spammers and terrorists and people who wanna sell us, uh, you know, uh, 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 shoddy uh, pills for all kinds of things, and you name it. But that somehow the enablement of the edge would allow people to contend with that and that it was good to diffuse power away from central authorities. Well, now we're in a debate, we're in, we're in, a, we're in a place where some of those central authorities have figured out how to use these tools. But if you look at conflicts, like look at what happened in Hong Kong, right? You're seeing radical self-organization using those technologies, fighting radical centralization using some of those very same technologies. And so this has become an interesting contested space. I'm not sure that ultimately anyone knows if one side or the other wins that war in the greatest sense of the conflict. So Andrew, I think that you have one of the most exciting and important jobs in the world. Um, and I want, uh, if you don't mind, can you tell us about your work at Planet and how you're using sort of space and space-based technology to its highest sure. purpose? 
Well, thank you for the question. Um, yeah, this is a kind of an interesting split screen because we're talking about these big systemic forces of change on the one hand. And I mentioned that there are these new technologies coming that give us dramatic new capabilities. So uh, let me start with what we're doing. So I work for, I'm the chief impact officer of an organization called Planet. Planet is a breakthrough geospatial earth observation organization. And I'm going to I'll show you, for those of you who are watching, a few things about uh, what we're doing in a moment, but let me just sort of start with the basic premise. So satellite technology, looking at the Earth, has historically been the provenance of two kinds of uh, um, actors. Scientists who are interested in studying the whole Earth system and like understanding the climate system, not at the level, you know, where, where they might take a picture of the Earth and every pixel in the picture is a kilometer wide. So they're just huge. They're trying to understand the whole system. So you have scientists at one end and you have spooks at the other. People who want to read the numbers on the side of the tank to understand from a nation state actor, from a defense and intelligence perspective, um, how to uh, best prepare for conflicts or how to execute, con execute conflicts or more generally just how to understand what was going on. But the important thing about those instruments is that you had to know where to point them to begin with. You had to actually know ahead of time where you, the tanks were likely to be. So a group of young NASA engineers, and one of the challenges of both these satellite systems is they take hundreds of millions to billions of dollars to make, and they, they take uh, decades to plan and, and build. And if you're an aerospace engineer, um, if you're lucky, you might get to work on, on a couple of them in your whole career. So a group of young NASA engineers who uh, were, were working at NASA Ames decided to do something different. They, they went down to the equivalent of Best Buy uh, at the time. They bought a stack of these things. I'm holding up my smartphone. They took their smartphone uh, stack back to the lab, took the guts out of the phone and built a tiny little satellite that you could hold in the palm of your hand. And they secretly gave it to one of the astronauts who's headed to the International Space Station and asked her to throw it out the airlock when she got there to see how well your phone would do in space. And it turns out your phone does great in space if it's shielded correctly. And these things have a camera and a computer and a GPS and a radio, all the things that the big instruments have. And that, uh, but in a tiny package because we spent trillions of dollars to kind of shrink them down. And that led to a revolution in the design of satellites. So today, Planet has deployed hundreds of satellites in a giant ring around the Earth. And for those of you who are watching, I'll, I'll see if I can uh, just share a, um, a view of my screen again. So what we do, if you can imagine uh, that you're, you're, you make a fist, your hand is the Earth, it's spinning around sideways on a regular basis. This is a, you know, on a daily basis. This is a group of satellites that spin over the North Pole down over the equator between the sun and the earth and then down over the south pole and up over the dark side of the earth and as they do so they act as a line scanner for the planet so we see everywhere on the earth every day at roughly three meters per pixel that's not enough to read your newspaper but it's enough to see every ship every active deforestation uh, every city street everywhere every building that everyone myself included and you megan too and all the people listening everywhere, every day. Now, again, we're not spying on people. We can't see people. We're not interested in people. But we, what we are interested in is, say, monitoring deforestation in the Amazon, finding uh, the kinds of shifts that might likely lead to, say, a mass climate migration, the growth of every refugee camp. Um, this is an essential and intrinsic tool for understanding change at the speed that the change is occurring. When, when uh, aerospace engineers build satellites that orbit the earth, they have to put special instruments on them that monitor the performance of the satellite faster than the satellite itself is moving or changing so that they can always keep it in balance. Well, this data, when analyzed with the tools of artificial intelligence, has intrinsic signals to tell us about things like climate change, to tell us about sustainable and unsustainable practices, to help us uh, hold each other to account and essentially to become a kind of truth engine, an independent source of, of real transparent information. And it, this uh, tool 
has, as you might imagine, profound consequences for international peace and security and defense and these kinds of, of issues. We believe very strongly in responsibly enabling a transparent planet. And we believe that that transparency, having independent sources of truth, actually reduces conflicts and de-intensifies them. Um, when the original charter agreement, the, 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 the space uh, charter, the, the, the UN treaty that actually governs the use of space was created in the 19, uh, 50s and 1960s, um, it was designed with that in mind. When the Americans and the Soviets were looking at each other, we, we had this idea that if we could see each other, that we could avoid unnecessary conflict or worse, accidental conflict. So we, this is all about the peaceful use of space. And indeed, actually the satellites, you know, often satellites are named for birds of prey. So we name ours for birds of peace, they're called doves. And our goal is to democratize access to the earth. And also, and I'll just end on this one idea, to, to build a kind of moral mirror for humanity. Every scientific and observational instrument that we've ever created from the alphabet to the genome sequencer has told us something about how humanity relates to the larger world and to each other. And those observations start as scientific observations and they become moral and ethical observations because they situate us in relationship to the whole. In the same way, these tools help us understand the effects that we're having on the planet. And I'll give you just one practical example of that. I'm gonna show people on the screen here something you can't see if you're listening. This is a view of deforestation in the Amazon over a few months sped up so that every frame, which is an image from one of our satellites, uh, shows you, takes a slow phenomena that we don't see and speeds it up so that we can see it. And what you'll see on the left-hand side of the screen here, if you're watching, is you'll see this rapid explosion of deforestation. Now, the deforestation of the Amazon is a paragon moral, climate, environmental, biodiversity issue. It's a huge issue uh, for the world. What you might not notice though, if you're looking at this screen, on the left-hand side of the screen, right after the deforestation occurs, if you watch, you'll see these little spider webs appear. And those spider webs are the illegal roads that are put in before the next round of deforestation occurs. They're the leading indicator that tells us that something bad is about to happen. If we have the ability to observe that, we can interdict that deforestation just before it's about to happen. And that's exactly what people are beginning to do now with tools like this one. But th this is, um, an, again, you know, I, I come from a world, I'll just share with everyone, where for a long time, we sort of celebrated the problems because we didn't have tools that were big enough to really drive solutions, but now we do. And, and that's the fascinating split screen moment we're in where we're in a real planetary crisis, but we've got profound tools, uh, the most profound tools we've ever had to, to work on them. I want you to sort of expand on that data, expand on how you're using all of those tools to, you know, implement, maybe work with partners, but maybe you can do it in conjunction with this, with COP, COP26 happening, you know, next week in Glasgow and, you know, what might be happening, how, you know, what, what they're going to be talking about, any predictions, um, but, you know, weave it into what Planet's doing and how you are working to make the world a better place. I could, I could easily, we could have just spent the whole hour talking about this one question that you're asking, Megan. So I, I really appreciate it. The, um, in order for us to, to make it through the great transition to a more sustainable place, to limit the effects of greenhouse gas emissions, um, even just consider this. Earlier this year, the Biden administration put forward a incredibly ambitious goal for the country which was to reduce our net carbon emissions to 50% below their 2005 rates by the end of the decade. Now, in order to fulfill that ambition, we have to do two things. The first one is we have to reinvent countless systems in energy and in um, transportation and in agriculture and land use and water. All of those things are implicated in uh, systems that contribute significantly. Let, let me give you just a couple of examples. What, the most basic one I can give you is um, today, one of the most energy intensive things we make is ammonia. And the, that ammonia is really nitrogen fertilizer that we apply to crops. 
um, if we can figure out how to use the data to, to help farmers know when to apply it and to apply less of it without sacrificing their yields, something we know this data can do, we can reduce the amount of ammonia that has to be produced with hydrocarbons and has to be transported to the field and has to be applied to the field and then runs off you know, the fields in, in, in Iowa down the Mississippi and creates a dead zone the size of New Jersey in the Gulf of Mexico. So we have to do all kinds of activities that, that where we change these systems and we have to do it immediately. But the other thing we have to do is have an observational capacity to tell us whether or not A, we're doing those things, and B, whether or not they're having their intended effect. And that's where systems like the one we built at Planet play in a hugely important role because they become the independent measurement reporting and verification system. In fact, actually, we have two, uh, I think, directly relevant things that we see happening at, at the COP. One is we've been working with this group called Climate Trace. It's a coalition of technical organizations backed by Al Gore. And they take our satellite imagery and they use the same tools that Google uses to tell you whether a picture is of a cat or a dog to monitor the operations of coal-fired power plants all over the world, like all of them. And they see when the plants are turned on and off. And then they use a special machine learning model to estimate how much emissions come out of those power plants. Well, that's data that's going to be directly relevant to measuring our progress against the Paris Agreement. And I think more generally, what I just say is this is a moment when the broad ambitions must give way to practical systems change. And you can't do that kind of practical systems change until you have lots of data and systems that to produce it to tell you whether or not you're steering in the right way. And this unites an earlier part of our conversation with, with this part of the conversation because the, one of the most important forms of glue in any resilient system is information. It's about the time value of that information, making it daily and high resolution and actionable. By being able to do that, we're actually able to help systems better navigate, to build the kind of navigational systems that we will collectively need. So we're working with governments all over the world to monitor deforestation. We're using this data to measure uh, climate emissions. We're using it to help climate vulnerable countries document their vulnerabilities so that they can justify additional financing requests to help them become more climate resilient. I could, we could go on and on, but, but let me just say one last thing about the COP. Um, we are in the most important year, in the most important decade of our collective lives. Every single person on this call uh, is living through this moment right now. We are, we are all in it together. This is not, in, and let me just give you a, a precise explanation. Our, our colleagues at the inter, uh, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change produced five scenarios for the future of the climate. In four of those uh, uh, scenarios, really horrible things happen. In the worst of them, big chunks of the planet literally become uninhabitable to humans. And the amount of pain and suffering and loss is truly unconscionable. There is only one scenario in which we limit the worst effects of climate change, which will continue to intensify whether we are successful or not. And they all require us to uh, act now. We, this is not next year, next, you know, it's not in the next three to five years. We have to start in earnest collectively immediately. And that's why it's alarming that some countries like Brazil and uh, China and India may not be sending their most senior governmental leaders to have a seat at the table because they're, they, they're worried about being dinged for their lack of, of progress. Um, so it's a, it's a very complicated and, and fraught moment. This meeting that's happening in Glasgow easily is the most important meeting happening anywhere on earth this year, in my opinion. Let me follow that up with a question from my colleague um, in, the, in Orange County, Nassim. Um, how can the U.S. use this knowledge to inform, uh, to inform the public uh, and foreign policy? Are you working with the White House? Are you working with Congress? We work, um, I can't comment on private conversations, but I can tell you that they are deep and ongoing. And this is a, you know, the, the Biden administration, uh, obviously you, you couldn't have a stronger contrast with the prior administration on, on this particular issue. Um, 
but the Biden administration likes to talk about a whole of government approach and uh, and we really need a whole of nation approach to these things. And I, I'm, I'll just say, there's one particular technology that we're developing uh, right now that shows how we're gonna do this work together. So uh, I'm just gonna, I show you uh, like, this is a real deal. This is actually what happened. So it's like really kind of a cool story. Um, when uh, Trump came to office, one of the things that his administration did was threaten to shut down all of the earth observation and climate data collection. And the then governor of California, Jerry Brown said famously, if the administration does that, we will build our own damn satellites. And our ears pricked up. Hey, you know, we, we make those things, we should talk. <laughs> so that led to this amazing collaboration between the state of California, the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, Planet, the Rocky Mountain Institute and a group of NGOs and a group of very high net worth philanthropists who've collectively put in well north of $100 million to build the first two of these new satellites called the Carbon Mapper satellites. These instruments are the highest resolution, most sensitive instruments for directly detecting what's called point source emissions detections of methane. So we can say it's that factory, it's that cow shed, it's that landfill, it's that oil, uh, oil pad or, or a natural gas facility down to uh, a, a really significant level of sensitivity and at very low cost in ways that allow regulators to say, we will reduce the cost of measuring the emissions and, hold it and, and understanding how people, who is accountable and we will make the cost of ignoring those emissions and not fixing those leaks incredibly expensive. So what happens is you get new regulatory structures that are built on top of new technology structures. And the technology structures in turn are the consequence of collaborations between organizations in the federal government, the state government, the private sector, the not-for-profit sector, and the philanthropic sector will all come together. And, and that system, uh, I think really sets an example for how we all do it together. So just a quick question from John in the audience. Um, the tools and the data capacities of monitoring are discussed, you know, here as the benign terms. He wants to know what about the potentials for, for malevolent ends? Absolutely. You know, uh, my, my favorite quote on this is from a uh, folk singer uh, I'm probably going to date myself. Her name is Annie DeFranco. And she famously sang in one of her songs, every tool is a weapon if you hold it right. So there are a number of things that are impl implicated in that observation. The first one is uh, that we have to take on a really significant ethical obligation of making sure we know who we're making these technologies available to. We want to democratize but we also have to be careful to keep it out of the hands of bad actors. And I'm, I'm happy to say that while we are absolutely not perfect and on a journey like, like many organizations, you know, we're coming of age as a technology organization after we've seen what can happen when technology organizations are not well governed in some cases and where systems can be abused. So we are uh, building in that ethical oversight very deeply from the beginning. Indeed, actually, uh, it's kind of written into, it'll be written into our bylaws as we become public company. The other thing that we have to do is make sure that we have a proactive ethical obligation to disseminate these tools to the right kinds of actors. So for example, I sit on the global board of directors of Human Rights Watch, the international human rights organization, Human Rights Watch uses these technologies to document human rights abuses and to create the forensic data that will be used for prosecutions under the International Criminal Court and countless other, other things that they do as well, along with countless other journalistic organizations, uh, humanitarian organizations, human rights organizations. And the reason that does not excuse or give a pass if someone uses it in a malevolent, uses these tools in a malevolent way. What it does, however, is create a deterrence effect. Because if you know that your behavior is being observed by people who know how to interpret it through this data, you may not take all the actions you might otherwise undertake. 
And we have direct evidence of that happening already in the world. So we want to build an ethical observation system. You know, my favorite uh, metaphor for this is is asked by the scient the scientists who who asked this basic question: Why do bees and birds and fish and human beings flock together? Why do we come together in groups? You know, coming together in groups if you have predators is very dangerous, right? Because you get one big fish that swims through the swarm and all of a sudden gets a good meal. Well, the best reasoning as to why this occurs is, be, is because of what's called the many eyes hypothesis. The idea is that all of those creatures in that swarm have slightly different points of view about the world. They literally are looking in slightly different directions and but between them, they have a 360 degree view of the danger and can move collectively out of the way. So that's the, that's the adaptive benefit that comes from having many eyes on the environment. Likewise, we think that if you can put many eyes on the world together from many different institutional perspectives, then you can create an environment of increased safety. And that comes from collective transparency and collective access. So that's what we work on. So we're almost running out of time, but I want to give you an opportunity to close us out. Um, you know, as you described the incredible work that you're doing, as you described the extreme urgency of the moment that we're in today, and knowing that, you know, all of us want to be, you know, uh, to have an impact, right? Not to feel powerless in this world. Um, I'm going to let you share your final thoughts with us, Andrew. Well, I think, um, we, we're living through the Chinese curse of, of, of living in consequential times. You know, we, we, this is a, a, a time when, when we need to think differently and we need to think about shifting relationally. Um, it's also an age when we need new kinds of institutions. And I'm, I'm, it's sort of amazing to think that we have a UN Security Council but we don't have a UN Climate Council, right? Or that the UN Security Council covers what it covers and doesn't cover what it doesn't cover. Just as, and I just, that's not to pick on the UN, that there, there might be an easy target, but rather to say just that we need institutional innovation. We need creativity. Um, this is a time to get up off the couch and get going. And there is no scale at which our actions are irrelevant. So if, your work is in your house, or if it's in your yard, or if it's in your neighborhood, or if it's in your community, it's equally relevant because we need collective, inclusive stewardship of the planet now. We are all astronauts uh, on this satellite together. We're co-piloting this astronaut, this, uh, this, this satellite around the sun, and I would say to you that that I I retain in my bones. Um, I'm I'm a deeply optimistic person. That optimism is regularly challenged by the things that I have to look at, but I believe uh, optimism is a moral choice because of the possibilities for action that it uncovers. So I would encourage you if the only thing you do is to preserve your optimism and faith in human beings, that in itself is a moral act that helps us collectively. From there, the possibilities are immense. We've never had tools like this. So we are so, I'm so excited about the application of those. And I, and I remain deeply hopeful about our ability to, to tackle these challenges. Andrew, thank you for joining us here today on, on State of the World. You've really set us up well for, for a season and, and given us a lot to, to think about. And um, I can't thank you enough for joining us today. My great pleasure. Thank you so much, Megan, and everyone at the World Affairs Council. And for those of you who, who joined us today and are listening in later, uh, it's great to be here with you. And uh, I look forward to seeing you online somewhere. Excellent. To echo Megan, Andrew, thank you so much for speaking with us today. Uh, thank you, everybody, for joining us. And we just want to encourage you to go buy Andrew's book, Resilience, How Things Bounce Back. 
Um, and to make sure you don't miss an episode, also want to encourage you to visit our website, ctwac.org, subscribe to the YouTube channel at World Affairs Council of Connecticut, and subscribe to the State of the World podcast wherever you get your podcasts. Uh, be sure to subscribe. You'll receive a notification when this episode is live and when all future conversations are posted. Uh, so one last plug next week, if you'd like to join us, we'll be speaking with Chris George in conversation on the ongoing refugee policy debate here in the U.S. Uh, and the refugee crisis in Afghanistan. Uh, so once again, thank you, Andrew. Thank you so much for sharing your expertise with us. Uh, we'll be watching the COP26 in Glasgow. And I just want to say thank you again, uh, everyone. And until next time. Bye, everyone.